بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سورة البلد is a Meccan surah uh, and more than one of the scholars of this tafsir uh, stated that it, it was a consensus of uh, the scholars that it is a Meccan surah The name of the surah is, according to the majority of the uh, books of tafsir, is the surah of Al-Balad. Uh, it was uh, set down after surah Qaf and before surah Al-Tariq, and there is no particular reason for revelation uh, of the surah. <coughs> and this surah, Allah Azza wa gives an oath uh, in a different uh, form than the usual form. Uh, Allah Azza wa Jal uses the form here uh, that has the letter La. Allah says La uqosimu bihad al bad. La is usually normally used to negate something, but here it is used to confirm the oath. Allah Azza wa Jal says, I swear by this city. The city here is uh, referring to the sacred city of Mecca. And when Allah Azza wa gives an oath by something, as we said earlier, it is to uh, reflect its high and lofty status. And this oath gives more honor to the city uh, of Mecca. See, the city of Mecca has the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the first house that was established, the first mosque, the first house of the houses of Allah Azza wa upon the earth that was ever established uh, was in Mecca. Uh, and it was the place which Allah Azza wa Jal made the resort, the place of return. People long to return to it. And it's a place of safety. Uh, SubhanAllah, and you see this uh, whenever you, uh, you go to Mecca for either Hajj or Umrah, uh, you meet new people and the one common comment people have is that, oh, inshallah, I will come again and repeat this beautiful experience. Allah Azza wa Jal made it people's nature to long to return to his house in Mecca. And it's, uh, it's an overwhelming feeling. You see that almost everybody who goes for the first time, and I've seen people who repeatedly uh, visited the, the Kaaba, the first time or at the first moment they, they enter the, the, uh, the Haram and they, their eyes land on the Kaaba, they cry without any control and they can't justify why they do that. I used to think this uh, was, you know, an exaggeration. So the first time I went to Hajj and I was, of course, in the state of Ihram, going in to perform Umrah. As soon as I reached in uh, close enough so I can see it, because you know it's congested during the season of Hajj, the first second my, uh, my eyes landed on the Kaaba, tears started coming out, I don't know why. So it's just, subhanAllah, Allah Azza wa instilled this love in the hearts of the believers to this uh, sacred place. It's a place that Allah Azza wa Jal made sacred, made it uh, impermissible for them to do any transgression, any fighting, any hunting. It's sacred and it's safe even for animals, even for plants. Uh, and one very uh, beautiful note which one of the scholars made, he said, SubhanAllah, Allah Azza wa Jal chose Mecca for the place to establish the Kaaba, though it's a place in the middle of a desert, surrounded by rocky mountains, it's all rocky, the area is all, there is no attraction, it's not an attractive place, as opposed to placing it in a place where there are greenery, rivers, mountains, uh, with flowers, whatever, right? Something that's attractive, naturally attractive to the heart, right? And he said, Perhaps the purpose for that 
is that when people go and long to return, they would have only one objective and one motive to make them come back, which is for the sake of Allah. Not for the sake of nice scenery, mashallah. We enjoy the river that no, no, no. It's a place that has nothing in it that is attractive, except that it is the house. وَأَنْتَ حِلٌّ بِهَذَا الْبَدَدِ وَأَنْتَ and you addressing Muhammad sallallahu and you are حِل حِل uh, was given different uh, interpretations by scholars the translation suggests one of them which is uh, you are free of all restrictions in this city now this is one of the interpretations is that the Prophet وسلم, although Mecca is a sacred place, place as we said, fighting and, and uh, hunting and cutting trees and plants and all that is haram, is prohibited, yet it was made lawful for the Prophet وسلم, to go and conquer Mecca, which at face value is violating the sanctity of Mecca. But Allah Azza wa Jal made it lawful for him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, It was made lawful for me for a set number of hours, a portion of the day only. Right? And if you notice, this is a Meccan surah. This was way before the migration to Medina. So in it, is glad tidings for the Prophet ﷺ and the believers who were oppressed. This was revealed during the time of oppression. The, the companions were prosecuted. The Prophet ﷺ was threatened. He was harmed. He was choked. They attempted to kill him. Right? And yet in the midst of all of this, Allah gives him this good news. That it will become lawful for you to fight them and you will enter it and fight them and take it. And it's a threat to the Meccans, to the Quraysh, that don't go on and continue to deny and belie and reject the message because your time is coming. Now this is one of the interpretations, right? Another interpretation for the word hill is while you are resident, staying, positioned in Mecca. Now, why would Allah Azza wa Jal mention His residence in Mecca? Now, the, the honor of something is derived from the person. The honor of a place is derived from or increases in its honor depending on who's its resident. So when Muhammad وسلم, is a resident of a place, it becomes more honorable and more glorified in, in Islam. Uh, and by, by swearing or giving an oath by Mecca while Muhammad وسلم, is in it, you see, the sanctity of Mecca was not something that was established when, when Muhammad ﷺ was commissioned uh, to call people for Islam or for the, the path of, to the path of Allah. No, it was sacred before. And the Quraysh knew that. And this is why, this is why they used to play around with the sacred months, right? So they won't fight during these sacred months. At, they knew that it was sacred and the sanctity of Mecca for them was there. So when Allah Azza wa Jal swears by this place and mentions the residence of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in it, and them knowing this fact that it's a sacred place, and yet attempt to kill him, torture his followers, which means they're transgressing. They're breaching the sanctity of the city, right? Which makes their position 
uh, look more awful than uh, and normally people would look at it because when you say, okay, he's, he's oppressing X or Y people, right? But when you add to it that he is, a, he's oppressing them in a place he knows he shouldn't be doing it, or in a way he's convinced he shouldn't be doing it, then his transgression and oppression appears or is exposed to people to be uglier than uh, what he tries to conceal it from appearing to be. Now, Allah Azza wa continues to say, وَوَالِدٍ وَمَا وَلَدٍ And I swear that is, and I swear by the father and that which was born. Now again, الوالد, walid and walad was given different interpretations. Some said that the walid is Adam, alayhi salam, and that which was born is all his offspring. Others said it was, it refers, the walid refers to Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wasalam, because it was him who built the, uh, the Kaaba. Uh, and in, in this, it being referring to, or it referring to uh, Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wasalam, is a note to the Meccans who were rejecting the message of Tawheed from Muhammad وسلم, that this is the land in which your father Ibrahim والسلام, built this sacred house, the Kaaba, and called people to Islamic monotheism, Tawheed, and you have shifted from the faith of your father Ibrahim alayhi salatu wassalam. And it was also said, and according to uh, an Imam al-Tabari, this is the predominant opinion, that walid is indefinite. So it's not referring to a particular person. It's rather referring to anyone who can get children and ma walad is referring to uh, all children that are begotten. Uh, and this general definition of walid and walad uh, is given in uh, reference to the uh, nature of uh, human beings and uh, its dependence of uh, production one generation after the other, which is the only means of its uh, existence and continuing to exist uh, on earth. And it's uh, introducing or paving the way to speak about uh, man and the nature of his life uh, and his life cycle. And it is also a, a sign of the ability and greatness of Allah Azza wa Jal. You know, what is, how is mankind produced? Right? It's two fluids coming together. Two fluids that there, there are no bones, there's no flesh, no nothing, right? It's two fluids that meet and Allah Azza wa Jal with His command, it's, it becomes a human being, it results in a human being that has all these miraculous aspects in his creation, right? And again, this is another sign of greatness and ability of Allah Azza wa Now Allah Azza wa is making an oath. I swear by this sacred city and by the father and the children or whoever can get children and the children. Now, the expected thing that Allah Azza wa is given an oath for, the answer that is, jawab al-shart, jawab al-qasam is, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ So Allah is swearing that this is true. What is this? We have certainly created man into hardship. 
Now Allah Azza wa Jal gave an oath to confirm that the nature of humans' lives is that it will entail hardships and difficulties. Whether they are believers or non-believers, whether they are righteous people or sinners, everybody goes into this life and has to go through the path of hardship regardless of the level of severity of this hardship. But everybody suffers from something. And take this from the beginning of the journey until the end of the journey. From the time one is created in the womb of his mother, he lives in tightness. He's dependent on his mother, right? And then he goes out, he's still dependent and he wants to suckle. And then he struggles crawling and then he struggles walking and then he struggles talking. And then he grows up as a teenager with all the pressure a teenager goes through and then life goes on with hardships. If you're not tested with your health, you're tested with your wealth. If you're not tested with this, you're tested with your wife. If you're not tested with your wife, it's with your child, with your father, with your mother. One way or another, you will be tested. Until the moment of death, as the Prophet ﷺ was saying when he was on his deathbed, Subhanallah, inna lil mawti sakarat. Subhanallah, death has hardships. You go through a lot of hardships when you're dying. Suffering. And the believer will not rest until he sets his foot in Jannah. We ask Allah to make us amongst them. The difference between people is that a believer or a righteous person struggles in this dunya to attain comfort and ease in the hereafter. Whereas the miserable disbelievers or sinners who transgress the boundaries and limits of Allah Azza wa will suffer here and there. With the difference between the disbeliever and the sinner, that the, the uh, disbeliever is eternal in misery and, and, and hardship and punishment in, in the hereafter, whereas the believer will be suffering for a, a period until he is purified from his sins and deserving of Jannah. But... Again, he will go through hardships in the hereafter. So this is the difference between uh, the two types of people. One thing in common is that they're all suffer, they're all be tested. But the consequence of that uh, is what differs. Now, and this is a lesson to the first believers who were addressed initially with the Qur'an, and to us, the followers of this great faith, is that you are, you'll be tested just like the, other, the others are being tested, right? So you're equal in, in this aspect or in this regard. But rest assured, your consequence, your fate is different. You're being promised in return for persevering, and maintaining yourself firm on the path that you will get the prize you're being promised, which is Jannah, the pleasure of Allah Azza wa Jal, seeing Allah Azza wa Jal in Jannah. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal not to deprive us from seeing His face on the Day of Judgment. Allahumma amin. Another thing uh, that's very beneficial in, in, in remembering this, the, the nature of life, is that it helps the believer uh, be content regarding the decrees of Allah, the qada and qadr. Uh, it makes the qada and qadr much easier to accept and, and deal with and live with, right? When you know that this is simply the way Allah created mankind, right? Uh, it makes it much easier for you to accept 
the qadr of Allah Azza wa When Allah Azza wa says, ما أصاب من مصيبة في الأرض ولا في أنفسكم إلا في كتاب من قبل أن نبرأها إن ذلك على الله يسير لكي لا تأسوا على ما فاتكم ولا تفرحوا بما آتاكم والله لا يحب كل مختال فخور. No disaster strikes upon the earth or among yourselves except that it is in a, in a register before we bring it into being. When you firmly believe that everything was recorded in this register 40,000 years before the creation of mankind or before the creation of all beings, right? It makes you content. Okay, this is happening regardless of what my reaction is, so I better have a good reaction so I don't lose out on the reward. Because if I'm dissatisfied and from not, if I'm not content with the decree of Allah Azza wa Jal, I lose out on the reward and I become deserving of the wrath of Allah Azza wa Jal. As the Prophet Sallallahu said, وَمَنْ سَخِطَ فَعَلَيْهِ السَّخَطَ And he who is displeased will become deserving of the wrath of Allah Azza wa Jal. In order that you may not despair over what you fail to get, it's a decree. You wanted to marry this girl. It didn't happen. Some people lose their mind. It's like it's the end of the world. There are other women. Allah didn't decree for you to marry her. She refused you or her family rejected you and she went on and married another person. So what? It's not the end of the world. You can go and marry someone else. You got fired. So what? It's the decree of Allah. Allah wants what's good for you. So He took you from this job in preparation to take you to a better place. And a better place here does not have to be a higher salary. It could be a place where your faith will be maintained, whereas if you stay, you lose it. So it's not always a worldly materialistic gain that you get out of the decree of Allah. And it's very important to keep this in mind, brothers and sisters is that the gain we get from Allah's decrees is not always worldly. And it's actually trivial when compared to the gain that is pertaining to one's faith and one's fate. So in order that you may not despair over what you fail to get, nor rejoice over what, you, what has been given to you. Right? It's decree. You'll get it, so it's coming. Your rizq is coming. As the Prophet ﷺ said, your rizq runs after you more than death comes after you. So whatever is given to you has been registered and whatever you were deprived from was also registered. So be content. Accept the decree of Allah Azza wa Jal as it is, regardless of what it is. Then Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah Azza wa Jal goes on to say, أَيَحْسَبُ أَن لَنْ يَقْدِرَ عَلَيْهِ أَحَدٍ Does he think, mankind, does he think that never will anyone overcome him? Does he think that this human being whose life, who the nature of his life is all hardship and tests, does he think that he would reach a level of strength or power or authority with which no one can overcome him he becomes untouchable to the extent as in the case of Fir'aun Ana Rabbukum Al-A'la I am your Lord the Most High and this is a uh, a question used for rebucking that the one who created you from nothing from a drop of sperm and 
cared for you and provided for you until you attain this power or this strength is able to overcome you. Allah can overcome us with many things and in different ways. One of the ways is death. Another simpler form is illnesses. Haven't you seen athletes, bodybuilders, boxers, martial art experts, masters, senseis, right? They grow old or they get a disease or they get paralyzed or whatever. They get a, a, a kick or a, a punch or something that makes them lose their control over their senses or become totally paralyzed and totally dependent on someone even to take them to the bathroom. So this is one of the ways Allah overcomes mankind. Hunger is a way of overcoming. Lack of sleep. Many people cannot go to sleep and take sleeping pills. Many people become deceived when they reach a certain uh, level of, of uh, strength, physical strength or power or authority or wealth. And uh, they go into the deception of, I am it. No one can overcome me, right? And Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, and they start acting like this. And they, try, they start transgressing and oppressing others. Just like the Quraysh saw that they were so powerful that they had the right to set their hands free in torturing and uh, persecuting the, the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا أَنَّ اللَّهَ الَّذِي خَلَقَهُمْ هُوَ أَشَدُّ مِنْهُمْ قُوَّةِ Did they not consider that Allah who created them? Again, Allah has reminded them that they're creatures, they were created by Allah, and that the one who has created them was greater than them in strength. Mankind has this tendency to become heedless of the source of his wealth, health, power, status, position, right? And if you are not blessed by Allah Azza wa Jal to remember that the source is Allah Azza wa Jal, you will become a tyrant at different levels, you know? Tyrants have different, they have a, different scales, right? You can become Fir'aun and you can become a, 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 mini, a mini tyrant, right? On a smaller scale. But it's all tyranny, right? It's all transgression. He says, this arrogant mankind who forgets the source of his wealth, health, power, so on. He says, I have destroyed abundance wealth. Notice that Allah Azza wa did not use the word spent. Allah said destroyed. And this is how arrogant people usually are. Man, I blew off a couple of thousand dollars on a dinner. What are you talking about? A couple of thousand dollars? What did you eat? Oh, I went to this such and such restaurant, man, and they have this and that. And then, uh, so I just spent and I give a very uh, good tip to the waiter. And, Destroyed. Another meaning for destroying wealth is when one spends it in ways other than the pleasure of Allah Azza wa Jal and the obedience of Allah Azza wa Jal. So it is destroyed in the sense that he does not gain any benefit from spending it. So he lost it in dunya and he lost its effect. In the hereafter, he gains nothing out of that. As a matter of fact, it's held against him. As the hadith, the famous hadith, that 
no one's two feet will move until he's asked about his wealth, about four things. One of them is wealth, where he get, got it from and how he spent it, right? And again, Allah Azza wa Jal here uh, mentions wealth because wealth is one of the means, one of the sources of strength, right? Because uh, in the previous ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal is talking about those who become so arrogant to the extent that their power and power, as we said, takes different shapes and means. One of them is his wealth. That's why Allah Azza wa Jal here is addressing one of these factors of uh, strength that uh, through which mankind becomes powerful. Another interpretation uh, in some of the books of Tafsir uh, is that some of the people of Quraysh were proud and proudly said, oh, we spent a lot of our wealth in our enmity against Muhammad sallallahu and his followers. Does he think that no one has seen him? This deceived, arrogant person, does he not know when he spent his wealth in, in the disobedience of Allah Azza wa Jal, that Allah Azza wa Jal, the all-seeing, the all-knowing, whose knowledge encompasses everything, and nothing except it escapes his seeing, is overlooking him and, and sees everything that he's doing? No one has seen him. No one saw what he did. No one saw his transgression. Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran says, وَإِن تَجْهَرْ بِالْقَوْلِ فَإِنَّهُ يَعْلَمُ السِّرَّ وَأَخْفَى And if you utter the saying aloud, even if you say something aloud, don't forget that, then surely he knows the secret and what is yet more hidden. So when you're doing something or saying something, don't forget that regardless of the shape of you saying it or doing it or the place in which you say it or do it, don't forget that Allah Azza wa Jal is seeing all of that and hearing all of that. Because Allah Azza wa Jal knows as little or as hidden as your thought that passes through your mind or your heart. The lusts or the desires that you have in your hearts are all exposed to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Allah sees everything and knows everything. So this man, this arrogant man, does he not know that Allah is seeing when he thinks in this way? Let us conclude with this verse for this session. And we will continue, inshallah, in the uh, following session. Subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu